Welcome, everybody. I am super excited to be here with you today and talk about building Volkswagen Group's digital ecosystem. My name is Uli Petri. I'm head of business technology platforms in Volkswagen Group IT. And with me on stage today is Thomas Reske from AWS, being my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. So in this session, we will have a closer look at the architecture of our digital mobility platform. And we will do a deep dive into a cloud platform built on top of AWS that over the next couple of years will be the foundation for our vehicle connectivity backend running more than 15 million connected vehicles. Now, let's get started with some facts and figures around Volkswagen. As you probably know, Volkswagen is one group consisting of 12 brands, including the, the volume brands such as Volkswagen and the premium brands such as Audi and Porsche. We have 123 factories around the globe, and from a sales perspective, we scored an all-time high in 2017, both in terms of vehicle sales and in terms of revenue. Now, as amazing as these figures really are, the challenge for us is that the automotive industry is in the middle of a massive transformation. With the vehicles becoming autonomous, electrified, and most importantly, connected, new mobility solutions such as robotaxis and rapid transit will evolve. The needs of our customers will be shifting from vehicle ownership towards access to mobility solutions, including shared and on-demand mobility solutions. And with the demands of our customers changing towards access to mobility, Volkswagen aims to refocus its business from selling vehicles, as we do it today, towards providing holistic mobility solutions. Now, as a company, we truly believe in transforming the status quo of mobility. And that is why in um, 2016, we have launched um, the biggest change process in our company history with our strategy 2025. Now, our goal is to become a globally leading provider of sustainable mobility. And that means we have to provide tailor-made mobility solutions to our customers. And linking it back to uh, the automotive leadership session on Tuesday, as Peter Gazzarella elaborated, this also means that we have to become a software-driven company. Now, you probably know that slide from Tuesday already. Um, talking about digitalization of mobility. For me, this requires a powerful platform connecting our vehicles and end customer services with our actual customers. And this is exactly what our One Digital Platform does. It provides the digital ecosystem for our mobility solutions in the group. Now let's zoom a bit into uh, the concepts behind the One Digital Platform. The One Digital Platform provides a seamless customer journey across all touch points, including vehicle, sales after sales, and intermodal mobility solutions as well. For example, with the One Digital Platform, our customers have one single login for all mobility services. And talking about intermodal mobility solutions, we truly believe that our platform needs to be open for external partners to contribute their mobility solutions. And on the other hand, gain benefit from the access to the vehicle that our platform provides. So for example, with our app, we experience um, that has been showcased in uh, the CBIT this year we provide a marketplace for external partners to provide uh, location-based offerings to our customers. And of course, new business models will constantly keep coming up based on the data stored in our platform. Now, from an architecture perspective, the One Digital Platform is based on a flexible cloud-native architecture. This architecture decouples the more static vehicle-related functions in the device platform 
from the more agile, innovative uh, services in the service platform. So, for example, you could think of a vehicle function, door lock, unlock, and this function will probably remain static over the full lifetime of the vehicle. It will not change. However, this function could be used in multiple end customer services, like, for example, car sharing or um, in vehicle delivery. And for sure, a, a powerful cloud platform is needed to support all the scalability and innovation we need for end customer services. And thinking it even a bit further in terms of edge computing, the vehicle will become more and more an integral part of the platform, meaning that the vehicle will no longer be just only an actor controlled by a device platform. It will become an intelligent device running the business functions at the edge. So now that we have jointly looked into what our long-term vision looks like, where are we today? Today, Volkswagen already provides a rich set of connectivity services around the vehicle. For example, App Connect, which lets you connect your smartphone to the head unit of your car and use your favorite apps, such as Spotify, via the HMI of your vehicle. Or security and service, providing security functions, such as a roadside assistance, and basic vehicle control functions, such as remote triggering of the auxiliary heating. So, from a functional perspective, the current connectivity services already provide some very good value uh, into our long-term vision. From a technical perspective, our current connectivity solution is powered by the MBB, which stands for Modularer Backend Baukasten. And that translates to Modular Backend Framework or Modular Backend Toolbox. So I like that German term. I had, I had to put it in, on the slide. Um, from a technical perspective, um, the MBB is um, based on a traditional on-prem architecture. It has been launched in 2011. It is um, operated in um, an x86 server environment. It is running in, uh, in a Tomcat Oracle environment, and it is basically a set of 100 plus applications, Java-based applications that over the last couple of years have become somewhat heavyweight and are not what you, what you, what you would really call a microservice-based or modular architecture. From an operational standpoint, we currently run two instances of the MBB. One instance, we operate in our data center in Germany, serving round about three million connected vehicles. And we operate a second instance in our data center in Beijing, serving round about 500,000 vehicles. So, with vehicle connectivity becoming a standard feature of our vehicles, we see a significant increase in the number of connected vehicles in the next couple of years. As already mentioned, we currently run 3 million connected vehicles on our instance in Europe. And we see this number growing up to more than 18 million connected vehicles until 2023. And to be honest, it will not just only be the number of connected vehicles that's going to grow. It will also be the number of services per vehicle that's going to grow. And it will be the requirements per service um, in terms of back-end capacity. The challenge for us here is that in our on-prem environment, we have a capacity limit somewhere around five to seven million connected vehicles. And we cannot extend that capacity. And according to our estimates, we're gonna hit this capacity limit end 2019, beginning 2020 latest. And that is why we have to re-architect our backend to become cloud native. We have to migrate our backend to the cloud to really cope with the growth curve we estimate. And that is why mid-2017, we have started a migration project to migrate our MBB to the cloud. Giving you some facts and figures around this migration project, some background. As already mentioned, 
we have 100 plus applications in scope to be migrated from the on-prem environment to the cloud. The first vehicle model intended to be launched on our platform will be the new Passat coming in 2019, which basically gave us only 14 months to finish the migration. And afterwards, the new Passat will be followed by around about 30 upcoming vehicle models, including like, for example, the new Golf also coming in 2019. And given that challenging timeline, we decided as a first step to not refactor the MBB from ground up. That would have put our, our SOPs, the start of production for the, S, uh, for the Passat at risk. We rather decided to leave the application from a, from a technical standpoint unchanged, wrap it in Docker containers, and deploy it to Kubernetes. The only major technical change we decided to make was to replace the Oracle database. And we also deliberately decided to not outsource this project. We really decided to do it internally and set up a team of 120 experts from all brands in the group and only extend our capacity with external partners as we need. So one of the key premises when we started the project was that we have to keep the current software delivery model as it is, because otherwise we would not be able to make the SOP for the Passat. And currently, software delivery is done by external development partners working in a traditional plan, build, run kind of delivery model. And as you know, this is light years away from what you build is what you run. And even though we work together with multiple external partners, we still have capacity constraints because we have a very challenging feature backlog for our upcoming cars. So once again, we could not break our software delivery model. And that is exactly where a powerful cloud platform, in that case, the MBB cloud platform, comes into play as an enabler to really take care of all the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So the MBB cloud platform uh, comes, with, comes with capabilities like, for example, CI CD, or a tool that we call Migration Factory, which is basically a set of concourse pipelines that take the code from the Git repo run the build process, resolves um, the dependencies, and creates Helm charts, which will later be deployed to Kubernetes. And of course, IT security and compliance is baked into the platform as code. And also for sure, the platform needs to provide all the low-level infrastructure services that the applications need so that the developers can truly focus on the implementation of the business logic. So our mission was, uh, when we created the, one, uh, the, the MBB cloud platform, the MBB cloud platform should feel as easy to use and as friction-free from a developer perspective as a Git push. And also, the MBB consumes a lot of data from our um, systems of records which we host on-premise, like, for example, vehicle life, um, life cycle information. And these systems will, of course, remain in our on-prem environment. So the MBB cloud platform needs to provide the required connectivity so that the MBB applications can, can seamlessly integrate with the, with the legacy world here. While at the same time, and this is super important, while at the same time being in line with our IT security regulations and requirements. Now, for us as Volkswagen, compliance, security, and stability of our vehicle connectivity backend is the top concern. And we really wanted to do that right from day one of the project. And that is why we are working very, very closely together with AWS to implement the platform according to AWS guidelines and best practices. And that is exactly why Thomas Reske from AWS is with me on stage today. And in the next couple of slides, Thomas and I will uh, give some insights into the technical architecture of this MBB cloud platform. 
starting with our most important principle, cloud agnosticity. So as a Volkswagen group, we migrate the core of our future business to the cloud. Yeah, we do nothing less. And this is why we really wanted to keep some flexibility in terms of dependency on our cloud provider. And to be honest, this is not predominantly due to procurement reasons. We really want to be flexible to deploy our vehicle connectivity backend to a local cloud service provider in case that becomes a future requirement. But on the other hand, I mean, we want to get as much out of the cloud as possible by using all the managed services that, you know, make you quick and get you up to speed. And here is what we think is a good balance for us. As an interface to the applications, yeah, the northbound interface, we only expose standard technologies, such as, for example, Postgres, Kubernetes, Elastic, Kafka, Vault, et cetera, et cetera. If such, a managed, if, if such a standard technology can be provided by using a managed service available at the cloud service provider, like, for example, AWS RDS exposes a Postgres SQL compliant database engine, if such a managed service is, is available, we're obviously uh, going to use this managed service. If no such managed service is available, we will self-operate this standard technology either by deploying it as a Docker container to Kubernetes or by directly deploying it to AWS EC2. Like, for example, we currently operate Kafka as a Docker container in our Kubernetes environment. However, I was quite excited uh, to hear that uh, AWS has, has, launched, uh, um, has launched Kafka as a managed service uh, earlier this morning, and we will definitely look into it. Now, Platform internally, we use the full breadth of AWS managed services that help us automate our platform. You know, for example, we use AWS organizations to uh, manage our service control policies. Or we use AWS Lambda to automate the connectivity between our VPCs to set up the VPC uh, connections, the VPC peerings, the VPN connections between the VPCs automatically. And we, for example, also use the code star suite to deploy our platform. And by following this principle, we have implemented the MBB cloud platform as a layer of abstraction decoupling the applications from the underlying cloud provider. And also following this principle, we are currently evaluating to switch our Kubernetes cluster management from COPS which we started with, to AWS EKS, which in Europe, and that is where we host our, our cloud backend, uh, which in Europe just became GA in August. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Thomas, who's going to give you some more insights into the technical architecture of our cloud platform. Please, Thomas. Thank you, Uli. So if you think, what is the most fundamental guideline that you can use in order to set up any workload or platform on AWS? we we'll probably come across the AWS well-architected framework. And Werner, in his keynote today, also asked, are you well-architected? So not surprisingly, um, the well-architected framework with its five pillars, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, as well as operational excellence, was also one of the key ingredients to answer some of the guiding questions that we had when building this platform. So the framework gives you design principles, for example, using automation via code to go to a model where you um, ship incremental small changes so you can reduce risk. Um, but it also provides you with questions that can help you in learning about architecting for the cloud. So it helps you to build also the organizational muscle which is required to actually set up a platform based on best practices, and therefore it also empowers your builders and your developers. So when you create a platform, you typically will have to think about how do I actually structure my AWS accounts. So a single AWS account provides the highest level of separation within the platform. 
So multiple accounts for a single corporation actually provide the same level of isolation than any other two random accounts. And this is really helpful, not just for compliance purposes and security reasons, but it also helps you around other factors which require some isolation. That could be economic things like, you know, chargeback, showback, cost control. But in the case of Volkswagen, we also used multiple different accounts to provide for environments, for staging, and even for segregating and separating different pieces of the workload from each other so that we kind of avoid running into API limits or that we hit throttling cases. So therefore, for example, Volkswagen created um, a front-end account and kind of a back-end account where the different data is moving. Uli already said that it's very important to help your developers to be very productive. And if you think about all of these low-level services that are shared amongst teams, then if every team of developers or builders has to kind of tackle the same problem over and over again, you achieve exactly the opposite. So they are not getting productive because they solve the problems that other people have, may have already solved. So it was a decision to provide some of the shared services in a centralized manner so that other teams can really borrow on the work that has been provided in the, by a central team. So what are some of these shared services that you will find? So these are around the topics of continuous integration, continuous deployment, but also around things like DNS and more specific and customer-specific services like RVS, which is used as a transfer mechanism for data across the enterprise, and it also helps to integrate with key services such as the enterprise service bus. And these shared service VPCs can easily be provided to other teams via means like VPC peering or using interface VPC endpoints, and therefore, Developers can really focus on their applications because some of these low-level services are already there and can simply be used. And this is not just true for services which are in the cloud, but also that require some integration with on-premise systems. So and you can already infer from the previous slide and from the comments that Uli made earlier on around the OEM legacy environment that connectivity is key. And very early in the, in the process, Volkswagen started to connect their data centers, their systems of record, their core services with AWS. And they used multiple redundant Direct Connect connections to do that. And they also quickly embraced the notion of Direct Connect Gateway um, because it really helped to simplify the planned network architecture it helped to reduce the administrative overhead, and we could simply leverage a smaller number of connections in order to establish the global reach. And on top of that, Volkswagen will also use partner technology. In that case, we created a transit VPC solution based on Palo Alto technology, and the Palo Alto VM series really helped with things like transitive routing concerns, end-to-end -end encryption, establishing additional firewall and security configurations, but also it really helped to cater for the existing skills of the network teams. And we could simply use the available automation that comes with the solution to also get new VPCs connected to the platform quickly and in a secure manner. And if we speak about security, um, I think there are not many companies like AWS and Volkswagen who have such a high standard when it comes to security. So both companies are actually obsessive about this topic. So it's priority zero, and we jointly worked on establishing a lot of security controls already early in the project thinking about what will be the required baselines to make sure that customer data is safe and that the platform really gives 
their developers the safety guarantees that they need in order to move fast without rethinking all of the security aspects of the underlying platform over and over again. So what were some of the things that we did? Obviously, we thought about pre-provisioned access for the security teams. We established some of the tools in order to harden images, to harden IAM policies over time. But we also thought about what are the, the things that we need to borrow from things like the sys benchmark to make sure that encryption of data is enforced and that we really have a centralized logging for security-related data. But it's not just about being able to log these data in a centralized manner. It's really also important to become more proactive about it. So we established a security event notification system that collects the data from all of the various accounts, and there are multiple. And we apply different security tools, different security packages, and thousands of rules, basically, to constantly monitor the environment for its security. And all of these events are centralized and uh, aggregated from the multiple regions. And it's not just AWS services like GuardDuty playing a role here. It's also top-notch open source software like Cloud Custodian from Capital One. And that really helps Volkswagen to also remediate risks as soon as they appear and to be constantly a little bit ahead when it comes to finding risk and mitigating it automatically. Automation in general is a key topic. And the attitude that you will find within the Volkswagen Group these days is everything is code and providing for complete automation across all of the different functions. So based on AWS services, Uli mentioned CodeStar Suite, but also partner and open source technologies like Terraform by HashiCorp and also Concourse CI, um, the platform is rolled out. And this is done across three different phases. So it covers the inception of an account, so-called bootstrapping, so really establishing the network baseline, establishing all the security tooling that I mentioned previously to get the account in a shape where the platform components can be put into that account. In the second phase, the platform components are rolled out. This is, as Uli mentioned, for example, the Kubernetes environment, but this is also the environment that you can use to provision databases and all of the other services which are provided by the platform itself. And then on top, developers are able to reuse templates and blueprints to get their application onto that platform. And that creates a whole different level of trust. It's hard in the beginning, and you go through some phases where you want to make that manual click, but then you see as much as you really um, invest into uh, the automation that there is a, um, also a big plus and a, and a huge benefit for the whole organization because you get a totally different level of trust into that platform. And this is not just true for all of the platform engineers, but also for the developers who really um, have that level of trust to use that platform. And level of trust is important, um, but if you think about these automation capabilities, it gives you a lot more other prominent objectives too. So it allows you to quickly roll out into multiple regions in this world, and by now, Volkswagen is able to roll out a new environment in just a matter of hours. So they can really go global in minutes and hours, but the way they have designed the pipeline to also roll out these baselines is important as well. It's about modularity, and if you have 120 experts and you have multiple different teams providing code to the platform, so you also have to make sure that it's not done in sequence and that they can really work in parallel. So the way that, for example, the platform repositories are also structured is that there are different repositories for the code that is used to automate the platform, to automate inception of the account. So individual teams can make contributions in parallel. And then, based on a serverless architecture, 
that data is actually triggering a pipeline process in which all of the different source code artifacts are synced together and you get a consistent deployment via a pipeline which in this case is triggered by code build. And then in a single account, the platform will be rolled out um, such as the VPC, um, but also all of the different IAM uh, roles that are required for cross-account access and so on. And that's the technology really pushing the platform one step ahead, but it also requires a specific mindset and specific people to make it work. And uh, with that, I want to hand it back to Uli, um, who will explore that aspect in more detail. Thank you, Thomas. So what did we learn in terms of organizational development? Because as Thomas mentioned, a cloud journey always has two aspects, a technical one, which we learned a lot about, and also an organizational one. And for me, the key success factor to develop a traditional organization that Volkswagen actually is towards cloud and digital, the key success factor is cross-functional teams from day one of the project. And on our slide, we have illustrated these cross-functional teams as all the involved entities sitting around a table, generating experiences and joint learnings. And in case of the MBB migration, this included IT security, legal, data protection, QS, QA being responsible for the overall quality of the car, Audi and the external development partners being responsible for the MBB application development, electronics engineering, EE, being the function owners of the MBB, and IT operations as well. And um, I just realized that there is one important entity missing, and that's us. So the latest update was not like pushed to this, uh, to this computer, so I apologize for that, but uh, we, are, we are also obviously part of this joint team. And for me, a very good example for the power of cross-functional teams is how our VPC design evolved over the course of the project. So when we started the project, we started with the VPC design for our core backend, and that is where the main business logic runs. We started with a VPC design that was very much like how you would do it in a traditional network environment. We started with multiple network zones and very, very complex routing rules between the subnets. Now, by understanding the capabilities of the cloud, like, for example, security groups, and how these capabilities can help to reduce complexity, the team jointly decided to drastically simplify the VPC design for the core backend. They decided to reduce the number of network zones to two with permissive routing rules between the subnets, but extended use of security groups. And to be honest, this would not have been possible when we started the project. It was only possible through the joint learnings generated in a cross-functional team. Now, continuing with the lessons learned, there are five key insights that I would really like to share with you. Number one, the implementation of a cloud platform is not like a traditional infrastructure project where you would plan everything in detail. You really have to embrace this everything as code concept and understand that you can iteratively enhance your platform. So get started as soon as possible and be ready for an evolutionary approach here. Number two, especially during the early phases of your platform, the relevance of the services provided by the platform is key. And the relevance of the services provided by the platform is clearly driven by the demand of the application development team. So you should tightly align the application development team and the platform implementation team to make sure that the technical services exposed by the platform match the demand of the application developers. Number three, everything as code requires strict discipline 
and a lot of practice. So validate and practice the automation of your platform as often as possible by redeploying over and over from scratch. By doing that, we managed to bring down the deployment time from initially three weeks to sub one day, as Thomas mentioned um, on the earlier slide. Number four, platform engineering is a new skill set in most traditional organizations. And so is it in Volkswagen as well. So platform engineers are basically software developers. Yeah? They, they develop infrastructure as code. But on the other hand, their skill set is significantly different to the skill set of application developers. So as an organization, you really have to invest time and money in setting up this new skill in your organization. And last but not least, do not forget about the people aspect of your cloud journey. Really spend some time with the IT governance functions to generate a joint mindset. And I promise you, this will pay off over the course of the project. Now, wrapping it up, we have started the cloud journey for our vehicle connectivity backend by migrating the MBB from the on-prem environment to the cloud. And to be honest, I am really proud and happy with what we achieved. However, we have more steps to take. So as a next step, we will refactor the MBB and make it more modular and uh, break down the applications into microservices. And by doing this refactoring, we will ultimately be able to scale our application to run, uh, to run 15 million connected vehicles. So for me, I like sports. I really like challenges, and this project really was a challenge. But working on the implementation of a cloud platform for our vehicle connectivity backend is also the most fascinating and exciting job I could think of because I have a direct value contribution to our core product, to our vehicles. Plus, and this is really near and dear to my heart, plus I am privileged to work with a 150% committed and amazing team. And it is precisely this unique combination of cool technology, real impact, and great team spirit that makes Volkswagen Group ID a really cool place to work. If you are interested in working on fascinating and innovative digitalization topics, please head to Career at Volkswagen and check out the opportunities. We are hiring. So, thanks. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for spending this session together with us. And uh, please remember to complete the session survey in your mobile app. Thanks again.